This is the question from an non-Muslim. Assalamu alaikum. Respected Dr. Zakir Naik and his team. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Rajiv Pass and I am a family medicine doctor living in New York City. I am married to a Muslim woman and we have a daughter together. I am learning more about Islam but I have few questions. The first question, why is shirk the biggest sin and not murder? The second question, why do Muslims perform Hajj and Umrah? Third question, why do Muslims have to pray five times a day? And the fourth question, if I convert to Islam, how do I deal with my family and friends who are never going to be okay with it and are Islamophobic? Looking forward to hear back from you. Assalamu alaikum. My phone number is so and so. Rajiv has basically asked four questions. Normally, we enter one question at a time. And he's a non Muslim who's married to a Muslim. And he has four important questions. And inshallah, I will try and answer all of them in short. His first question is that why is shirk the biggest sin in Islam and why not murder? And shirk means associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator, our almighty God. And Allah says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 48, and Surah Nisa chapter number 4, verse number 116, that if Allah wishes, if Allah pleases, he may forgive anything, but the sin of shirk, he will never forgive. For anyone who has associated partners with God, he has strayed far away, and it is the most abominable sin. Based on this verse of the Quran and various, uh, various other hadith, we come to know that the biggest sin in Islam is shirk, that is associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator. And Allah also says in the Guru's Quran, in Surah Maidah chapter number 5, verse number 32, that if anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And if anyone saves a human being, it is as though he has saved the whole nation. This verse of the Quran says that any person kills any other innocent human being, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. So based on this verse of the Quran and various other hadith, we come to know that killing an innocent human being is the second major sin in Islam. So the question posed by Brother Rajiv is, that why is shirk the biggest sin in Islam and why not murder? We have to understand that these rules are laid down for the Muslim. And a Muslim is the person who accepts and he submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Muslim is the person who has obtained peace by submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the basic requirement for a Muslim is that he should say the shahada, that is, he testifies that there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of this great Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, why is shirk the biggest sin in Islam? Because we come to know and we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our creator who has given us this life who has given us this body, who has given us the niyama, has given us the house, the clothes, all the facility. He is our creator and he is our Lord. Therefore, laying allegiance to him is of utmost importance. And obeying the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very important. And a Muslim has to submit his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And shirk means associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means worshipping somebody else besides our creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is called as shirk. Imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you all this niyama, this body, the health, the wealth, everything. And if we do not thank him and we worship somebody else, this is the biggest sin in Islam. Now the question poses, why is this more bad than murder, killing an innocent human being? The reason is 
that in the first case you are doing shirk associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is directly against our creator who has given you all these blessings and niyama. In the second case, what you're doing is you are killing someone who is the creation of the creator. So if your creator is the boss, following his advice is more important. For example, let me give you an example for a better understanding. That suppose you want to study and acquire education in the best school. And out of the 10 schools available in your city or in your country or in the world, you select the best school. When you take admission, taking admission is a must to study in that school. And once you take admission, you have enrolled and you are called as a student of that particular school. Similarly, when you submit your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you give the shahada that there is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, you have entered into the fold of Islam and you are a Muslim. Now imagine if you want to study in a school and if there are various things you want to achieve, you want to pass standard 1, standard 2, standard 3 and you want to educate yourself and you want to pass from the school. And if someone tells you that what is the most important thing that you have to do, but naturally you have to see to it that you enroll yourself in that school. Then only can you educate yourself in that particular school. Imagine if you say that I will, I will remove myself from the school. I, after taking admission, if I go out of the school, will I be able to study in the school? And the answer is no. So what is more important? Passing the exam is more important, passing stand one is more important or which is a bigger sin? Failing in the examination is a bigger crime or for you to be kicked out of the school or for you to be rusticated from the school or for you to be for, for you to go out of the school. Between the two, if you want to educate yourself and see to it that you pass from the school, there are various things required. You have to attend the college, uh, sorry, you have to attend the school, you have to do your homework, you have to uh, attend the classes, you have to obey your teacher, you have to read the books, you have to pass the examination. Of course, passing the examination is of utmost, is, is of utmost, uh, utmost importance. And if you fail, it is a big sin, it's a big crime in the school, as far as the school is concerned. But for you to be rusticated from the school is more bad than failing the examination. So similarly what you have to understand that murder is a major sin in Islam. So is shirk. But between the two in Islam, shirk that is associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator is a much greater crime. It's a much greater sin. And that is the reason Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 48 and Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 116 that if Allah pleases, he may forgive anything. But the sin of shirk, he'll never forgive. That means he will never forgive you associating partners. It is like being rusticated from the school. If you do shirk, you are outside the fold of Islam. Similarly, once you take admission in a school, once you are rusticated, then where is the question of you failing or passing the examination? Passing the examination is of utmost importance. But if you are rusticated from the school, does it make any relevance whether you pass the examination or not? So in the same way, though murder is a very grave sin, as Quran says, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. But there are chances that if you commit murder, and if you repent, and if Allah forgives you, you can be forgiven. Similarly, if you fail in examination, you can reappear in the examination. It's not the end of the world. But if you are rusticated from that school, can you ever pass from that school? And the answer is no. That's the reason if you do shirk, it is the biggest sin in Islam. Like being rusticated from the school or once you take admission, if you leave that school, then where is the question of you passing the examination or gaining knowledge? But natural, you may ask the question 
that once I leave the school, can I not join the school? Similarly, if you do shirk, and if you do not die the mushrik, and if you ask for forgiveness, Allah will forgive that also. That means only if you die as a mushrik, while doing sh shirk, and without repenting, then that is the major sin. If you do shirk, and if you ask Allah for forgiveness, inshallah, maybe Allah will forgive you, and again you can be readmitted to school. But between the two, of course, shirk, that is going against our creator, who has given you all this niyama, is logically a bigger sin, even than committing murder, which is also a big sin. So in Islam, according to Imam al dhabi the biggest sin, number one, is shirk, and Murdering an innocent human being is the second major sin. The second question posed by Brother Rajiv was that why does a Muslim perform Hajj and Umrah? Hajj is the fifth pillar of Islam and it is compulsory for every adult Muslim who has the capacity who has the economic means and the health and the same Muslim that he should at least perform Hajj. That is the pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca along with his all, all the rituals of Mina, Arafat, etc. at least once in his lifetime. This is the fifth pillar of Islam. And why is Hajj compulsory for every adult Muslim who has the means and the money and the health to perform it. The reason is that Hajj and Umrah, Umrah is also called as a minor Hajj. You can do Umrah and then do Hajj later, but for doing Hajj, you have to first do Umrah, that's a minor Hajj, you can combine both together. Hajj is the largest annual gathering in the world, where about 4 million people, but naturally during the pandemic it was less, but before the pandemic, the actual figures are somewhere 2 to 3 million, that's the official figure. But the unofficial figure, about 4 million people from all over the world, from different parts of the world, whether it be USA, Canada, UK, Malaysia, Singapore, India, Pakistan, from different parts of the world, they get together and perform Hajj every year. It is the largest annual gathering. And the men, they are dressed up in two pieces of white unsewn cloth. And you cannot identify the person next to you while performing Hajj in the Ahram, whether it's a king or a pauper. It is the best example of universal brotherhood. And if a Muslim performs Hajj, his experience is something different. And it is completely a new experience. You come to know the brotherhood that, you know, whether you are rich or poor, whether you are king or pauper, you do hajj together, shoulder to shoulder. Whether you are black or white, yellow or brown, people from all over the world, it is the best example of universal brotherhood. It makes you realize that when you are performing hajj, you may be at home a millionaire, you may be a billionaire, you may be having all the luxury, but when you are doing tawaf around the Kaaba, the person, whether he is a servant, or whether he is a poor person, or whether he is a pauper, or whether he is a king, we are all equal in the front of our Creator. It's an experience which is phenomenal. And there you find that people of different races, of different color, of different countries, they all gather there saying, Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik. Here we are, oh my Lord, here we are at your service. So this experience is something which is phenomenal. It has changed many people's lives. And the hadith of the beloved Prophet that if your hajj is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you return back as though you are a new, newborn child. That means all your sins are forgiven. So if you perform hajj with the proper niyyah, with the proper intention, and if Allah accepts the hajj, the hadith of the Prophet says that all your sins will be forgiven. It is very important for the Muslims because it is one of the pillars of Islam. Amongst the five pillars, it is the fifth pillar of Islam that every Muslim, every adult Muslim, who has the means, whether financially or health-wise, and is seen, he has to perform Hajj, that is the pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca in the month of Hajj, at least once in his lifetime. The third question asked by Brother Rajiv was that, 
why should a Muslim pray five times a day? And I've given this answer in detail in my lecture, Salah, the programming to righteousness. How a medical doctor will tell you that for a healthy body, you have to have three meals a day. Similarly, for a spiritual soul, our Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed for us five times daily prayer. The English word pray does not define the Arabic word salah. To pray means to ask for help, to beseech. But the Arabic word salah has a much more broader meaning. It doesn't only mean asking for help. And I've given a talk on Salah, the programming to righteousness, and I prefer calling Salah as the programming. You know, because we are being programmed in our Salah. We are being given guidance. Allah is guiding us in the Salah. We are asking for help, and we are also being shown how the life to be led. Therefore, I prefer calling it like a programming towards righteousness. For example, the Imam in, in the Maghrib Salah, after Surah Fatiha, he may recite Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90, where Allah says, Ya ayladhin amanu, inna mal khamru wa maisuru, wa anthawal aslamu, rithum ni muni shaitan, first ni mulu lukum tuflihun. That, oh, you believe gambling, oh, you believe verily gambling, intoxication, dedication of stone, divination of arrows, these are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it that you are that you may prosper. Here, you are being given guidance in the Salah that Allah is telling you that gambling, intoxication, idol worship, dedication of stone, these are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it that you may prosper. So we are being programmed. For example, the Imam may recite Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 188 which says that do not use your wealth as a bait to judges so that you may eat other people's wealth. Here you are being programmed that bribing is haram. So I rather call Salah the programming to that justice. And today we know that the amount of things that happen around the world you know when you when you walk around the street you may see some obscene things you may see things which are wrong, you may think things that are haram. So that's the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his divine wisdom knows that if you pray five times salah, you are being reprogrammed. And this five times salah is a dose for you to keep you on the straight path, to keep you on the salat al mustaqeen That's the reason Allah says that every Muslim minimum should offer five times salah. And the times have been prescribed when Fajr salah just before sunrise, the Zohar Salah after the sun at the highest point, the Asr Salah in between the sun at the zenith and the sunset, then the Maghrib Salah immediately after sunset, and, and the Isha Salah about one and a half hours after the dawn ends. So these five times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed to us, like how a doctor says, if you have three meals a day, it keeps you healthy. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Five times Salah will keep you spiritually on the Sirat al Mustaqeen. So, this is a programming towards righteousness and it disciplines a person. And once a Muslim offers Salah five times, he realizes the importance. Those people who don't offer Salah may not realize the importance. Once a person starts praying, he realizes how important it is. If he prays five times a day, he knows how important it is. Then, when he starts praying in Jamaat, he knows it is more important to pray in Jamaat. If, and it is recommended by our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that you have to pray five times in Jamaat in the mosque. And those people who pray five times Salah in the mosque, in Jamaat, they realize the importance of it. And if you are, if you pray five times Salah, and if you miss any salah, you feel like fish out of water. The amount of serenity, the amount of calmness, the amount of peace that you attain, the tranquility that you attain in salah is phenomenal. That's the reason uh, 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 
our Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed for us five times salah. It disciplines us. That on time when you hear the azan, you leave everything and you attend to the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You attend to the call of salah. So that's the reason salah to keep you on the salah of the Five times offering is compulsory. The fourth question asked by Brother Rajiv was that if he accepts Islam, but naturally his friends and relatives would not like it, and since most of them are Islamophobic, how will he be able to deal with them? And that's a very good question. And I do agree with you that because of the media that we have today and the misconception that is spread in the media, we find that Islamophobia has spread. And there is misconception being spread about Islam. That is the reason many non-Muslims are not aware of the, true, of the true teachings of Islam. And I do agree with you that maybe most of your friends or relatives will not like that you accept Islam. So what should you do? My recommendation to you would be that you read the translation of the Glorious Quran and understand the essence of Islam. And later on, you should read my book, The Most Common Question Asked by the Non-Muslims. I've written a book on the 20 most common questions asked by non-Muslims. And I've given replies based on reason, logic, science, and Quran, and the authentic scriptures. And based on this, I've replied to the common misconceptions. Once you know the answers to the common misconceptions, or the common question which a non-Muslim will ask, that a non-Muslim may ask you, you feel empowered. You feel comfortable and you will not shy to call yourself a Muslim. The, all the common questions that are there, that about jihad, Islam was spread by the sword, Muslims are called as terrorists and fundamentalists, why is a man permitted to marry more than one wife, why is a woman asked to do hijab, all these common questions it's also available as a lecture form. If you read this book of mine and you memorize the answers, you will be comfortable replying to these questions. And if you go to the website, zakirnaik.com, the answers are there. There are many other questions. But naturally, once you accept Islam and when your non-Muslim friends or relatives ask questions to you, of course, if you're able to answer, you'll be more confident, you'll be more peaceful, will be more proud to call yourself Muslims. So this book, and if you go on the website, there are various other questions, common questions asked by Christians, common questions asked by Hindus, common questions asked by atheists. There are hundreds of questions, the reply to which is given. Once you can start initially with the reply to the 20 most common questions. And my advice to you is that when you meet your relatives, especially the parents, you should see to it that they find a marked difference in your behavior as compared to what you were before you accepted Islam. For example, maybe you used to obey your parents 50% of the time. Now, once you become a Muslim, you should obey your parents 100% except those things which are against the teaching of Quran and Sunnah, against the teaching of Allah and the Rasul. For example, your mother wanted you to wear blue, wanted you to wear a blue shirt, and you did not like blue color. Now in Islam, blue is moba. And if your mother asks you, all the more reason you should go out of your way to wear blue color. So your mother should find a marked difference. Okay, before accepting Islam, my son Rajiv, he never used to follow, never used to agree with my wish of wearing blue color. Now he started wearing. Once you, once you accept Islam, see to it that you give more time to your parents. See to it you are more humble to your parents. Maybe if you visit your parents once a month, see to it you start visiting once a week or make it every alternate day. See to it that you support if you are earning, give a percentage of your earning to your parents, whether it be 10%, 20%, depending upon your capacity. See to it that you take care of them, you love them. There should be a marked difference. They should ask, what has happened to you, my son? Then you should say that in Islam, 
we have to respect our parents. And Allah says that you have to be kind to your parents. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that paradise lies beneath the feet of your mother. That means even if she is a non-Muslim mother, yet according to the hadith of the Prophet, paradise lies beneath the feet of your mother. You have, that means you have to love her, you have to respect her, you have to obey her. Only those things which are against the teachings of the Quran and Sunnah, against the teaching of the Sharia, against Allah and the Rasul, only those things you need not obey. The remaining, you have to follow her, love her, and see to it that this is a marked difference. Same thing with the brothers and sisters. So once you accept Islam, they should find that there, is, there should be more compassion in your behavior, you should be more peaceful, you should be more loving. Same thing with your friends. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 34, that repel evil with good. You may never know that in a person's heart who is an enemy, he may become your friend. So I do agree with you because of the Islamophobia. It will be difficult for you to speak to your friends, but once you have knowledge and once you know the answers to the common questions asked by non-Muslims regarding Islam, you will feel more confident, you will, you will proud, you'll be proud to call yourself Muslims and surely you will never shy yourself and the main point is you will be fulfilling a very important fard of Islam. In Islam, one of the faraiz is that you should dawa. You should convey the message of Islam to those who are unaware about it. So it's your duty that once you accept Islam, you have to spread the message of Islam and try and convince them. So inshallah, my advice to you brother is that, of course you are quite well read and you are aware of it, that see to it that uh, you accept Islam wholeheartedly and you follow the guidance given in the Quran and the Hadith. And once you memorize the answers that are given in the book, you will feel more comfortable You'll, you'll feel more comfortable facing a non-Muslim relative than friends. Hope that answers the question.